A year ago I said at this conference that our country's collective failure to build enough houses has significantly impacted almost every aspect of New Zealand society. Homelessness, inequality, poverty, poor productivity, economic growth, very relevant with the news we've just heard, uh, and intergenerational mobility. And I stand by those comments. And a year ago I outlined a plan to fix those problems. Uh, and now I get to put it into action alongside my coalition government colleagues from ACT uh, and New Zealand First. Solving our housing crisis is going to take all of us, people in this room today, tradies on the building sites all over the country right now, the planners, local government, investors, developers and builders. It's going to take a collective effort uh, and I think government leadership is critical. The coalition government's agenda to fix the housing crisis consists of five interlocking actions. Firstly, our going for housing growth policy to smash the urban limits that are holding our cities back, fix infrastructure funding and financing and introduce incentives for cities and regions to go for housing growth. Secondly, improvements to the rental market to make it easier to be a landlord and easier to be a tenant. Thirdly, building and construction changes to improve competition and lower uh, building costs. Fourthly, better social housing to look after those who need support. And fifthly, Fundamental Reform of the Resource Management Act 1991. Last month I gave a speech to the Wellington Chamber of Commerce where I announced that Cabinet has agreed to uh, our ambitious going for housing growth policy agenda which aims to deal with the underlying cause of our housing problems. I call it the housing trifecta, land supply, infrastructure funding and financing and incentives for councils to go for growth. Now on land supply, I think most people in the room are probably aware of my views. We are a small country, but we are not short of land. Uh, but restrictive planning uh, laws have held our cities back from growing, both at the edge of our cities and also up inside them. I think we can create thriving, beautiful, connected cities in New Zealand that drive economic growth and allow for affordable housing. The right path forward is to allow both greenfields and more density. We need abundant development opportunities and we need housing choice. So we'll be advancing policies as a government that smash urban limits, let our cities grow, uh, and that make housing growth easier both inside our cities uh, and at the fringe. We'll be making some changes to the National Policy Statement on Urban Development, particularly to allow for mixed-use zoning, especially around transport nodes. We're also going to be allowing councils to opt out of the medium density residential standards if they wish. Now, the government's position is that the MDRS, as they're known, those tools were too blunt, too one-size-fits-all. Councils that wish to continue to use them uh, will have to ratify their continued use. Now one complexity to all of this is that many councils are at different stages of altering their plans to give effect to both the MPSUD and the MDRS. When I spoke to the Wellington Chamber of Commerce last month, I mentioned that from now on uh, I'm going to be the decision maker on relevant district plan changes relating to housing where councils and independent hearings panels don't agree, or where there are requests for extensions to timeframes. That's in my capacity as RMA Reform Minister. I can update you today on a couple of things in relation to that. Firstly, in Wellington's case, you'll probably see in the media that City Council has rejected many of the independent hearing panel uh, recommendations and instead adopted many of their own. Now that landed in my inbox on Tuesday this week, so two days ago. Uh, now I have to uh, now follow a very careful process where I consider the Council's recommendations to me and I'll be taking advice from officials uh, on that. I will then make the final decision on whether the Council's recommendations should be followed or those of the independent hearing panel. Uh, in Auckland's case, you might be aware that Wayne Brown uh, has written to me asking for an extension of time for Auckland to work through uh, PC78, Plan Change 78. Auckland's in a unique situation at the moment for two reasons. One is the impact that the anniversary weekend floods and Cyclone Gabriel had on the city in areas that were tagged for intensification. And the other is that the government has scrapped Auckland's uh, light rail project meaning Auckland no longer has to take theoretical future light rail stations into account when they uh, think about upzoning. So I can announce today that I spoke with Mayor Brown on Tuesday uh, and confirmed that the council here in Auckland may have a further one year extension for their process. Uh, that's to the 31st of March 2026. The previous government gave them an extension until 2025. We're going to give them an additional extension until 2026. I also let them know that my expectation is that the Council will continue to progress the um, National Policy Statement on Urban Development uh, changes uh, as quickly as they can, 
uh, to ensure development capacity is enabled as soon as possible. The one-year extension will allow the council to take into account the zoning work for light rail, as I said, uh, the impact of the floods, and also our intention to make the medium density residential uh, standards uh, optional for Auckland and other councils. The other two elements of our going for housing growth policy are improvements to infrastructure funding and financing and creating financial incentives. Uh, and we've talked openly about possibly adopting the ACT Party idea of sharing GST on new, uh, new developments with councils. And I'll have more to say about those uh, matters in the coming months. Let me talk briefly about social housing, which is the fourth element of our plan. I think it'll be fair to say we've inherited a real mess. The social housing waitlist grew by around 20,000 families from 2017 to 2023, and there are currently around 3,000 families living in motels, costing taxpayers around a million bucks a day. Recently, Louise Upson and I announced a new priority one category for the social housing waitlist. How this will work is it will place families with dependent children who've been in emergency housing, motels, for 12 weeks or more and bump them up to the top of the wait list so they're first in line for social housing. Our view is that families and kids shouldn't be in motels. We need to do as much as we can to get them out of motels and into warm and dry housing. At the same time, we're going to tighten the eligibility for emergency housing. Living in a motel should be a last resort. We have already launched an independent review into Kainga Ora, led by our former Prime Minister Sir Bill English. The government is not happy with the performance of Kainga Ora, from its financial situation, procurement, asset management, and uh, their performance has a significant impact on the government box, including on uh, Obergall surplus or deficit. It's critical that they are focused on efficiently building social houses for people in need, while also delivering value for taxpayers' money. We're expecting the review to report back uh, in a couple of weeks, and I'll have more to say after that. Thanks for checking out our YouTube channel to stay up to date with all the latest news from the New Zealand Herald. Click the subscribe button below or check out one of the videos here and head over to nzherald.co.nz for more details on these stories and more.